Okay, we're moving on into Mark's Gospel, chapter 15. Very early in the morning, the chief priests and the elders and the teachers of the law and the whole Sanhedrin reached a decision. They bound Jesus and led him away to turn him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? He asked Pilate. Yes, it is as you say, Jesus answered. The chief priests accused him of many things. So again Pilate asked him, Aren't you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of. But Jesus made no reply. And Pilate was amazed. Now it was a custom at the feast to release a prisoner whom the people requested. Now a man named Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. Now the crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them, as he usually did. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate, knowing that it was out of envy that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priests had stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the king, the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder. Crucify him! Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He then had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away into the place which is called the Praetorium and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him. They twisted together a crown of thorns and sat it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spat on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe, put on his own clothes on him, and then they led him out crucify him. There was a certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to a place called Gogoroth, Gothaha. Golgotha, sorry, which means the place of the skull, and they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. Then they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast Lot to see what each would get. It was the third hour when they crucified him. A written notice of charge was against him read the king of the Jews. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. And the scriptures were fulfilled which said he was counted with the lawless ones. Thus, those who passed by him hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So you are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days? Come down to the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said. Let him now come off the cross that we might see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At the third hour, sorry, at the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then some of them standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. One man ran, filling a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a stake, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud voice, with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus heard his cry and saw how he died, 
he said, surely this man was the Son of God. Some women, some women were watching from a distance. Among them was Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Jules and La, La Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women had come up with him to Jerusalem and were also there. It was the preparation day. That is the day before the annual Sabbath, which is the first day of unleavened bread. So the evening approached. Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself awaiting the kingdom of God, went boldly to Herod and asked for Jesus' body. Herod was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. And when he learned from the centurion that it was so, he took the body and gave it to Joseph. So Joseph took some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of the stone. Then he rolled the stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus, saw where he was laid. There's a lot of information given to us here in this 15th chapter of Mark. We see that early in the morning the chief priests and the leaders of the law had reached a decision. And that decision was that Jesus had to die. But because of the rules of Roman law, it was not permitted for them to carry out the execution themselves. Therefore, they had to present before Pilate for Jesus to be dealt with as a criminal against the state. This is why we're told that they accused him of many things. But Pilate recognized that Jesus, not only was he not defending himself, but, but he also recognized that he wasn't guilty of any of these things. Jesus had been in Jerusalem and going around the areas all around Jerusalem, Judea, Galilee, Nazareth. He had been doing, walking through these areas teaching and preaching and healing and doing good works for three and a half years. It was impossible for, Herod, for Pilate not to have received major intelligence about this individual who was bringing such crowds to him. So Roman spies would have infiltrated the crowd. They would have found out exactly what was being taught, what was being, what was being proclaimed. And we also know this because many of these individuals later became prominent Christians themselves. But there's other things that we have to understand. Pilate understood that Jesus was innocent of the charges. He understood that this was simply the high priests wanting to get rid of what they consider someone who was taking their glory away from them. So he looks for every opportunity. As it was customary to release somebody, he, instead of asking the people whom they wanted released and waiting for the petition to be brought to him and deciding whether or not he was going to do this, making a big show of it, he breaks with tradition slightly. He offers the people to release to them the king of the Jews. He offers to release Jesus. But the people are stirred up in the crowd by the priests and the leaders of the synagogues and of the law and all the rest. And, and they have been told, no, no, we need Barabbas, we need Barabbas. And so the mob mentality starts to build up here and we find that the name Barabbas continues coming up. But Pilate is still perplexed. Well, what would you people want that I would do with this king of the Jews? See, he's somewhat baffled. These people have received a, a miraculous healing from this man. They have watched, witnessed miracles, which he has, he can testify to it because he's got written reports from his spies about it. He knows all about those things. Nothing was hidden from him. I mean, none of this was done secretly. The, boss, the Gospels tell us that. So Rome knew all about these things. 
Everything that Jesus did was not hidden. And so he's rather surprised when the people say, crucify him. What? Why would you want to do that? And he asked them again. But again, they were saying again and again, crucify him. And he realizes he can't go to good anymore. He doesn't want a rebellion here in his hand over this matter, so he agrees. But he publicly washes his hands, not recorded in Mark, but in all the Gospels, he publicly washes his hands to tell them this is not a decision that would have been made by Rome. That's what he's saying here. We're agreeing to it because to keep the peace, but this is not a decision which Rome is making. This is the decision that you are making. The soldiers, when he's handed over, were told, mock him. And it, that was quite common. But what wasn't all that common is that the entire company of soldiers were called out. And there would have been a reason for this. They wanted to see this man, who many of them had witnessed from a distance. They'd heard the rumors and the reports. This was the miracle worker. This is the one who healed. He even healed a centurion's servant. He was known to them. But he wouldn't do anything for them. He wouldn't perform or talk to them or discuss anything with them. So they began to mock him. They began to take advantage of him. They put a large purple robe on him. They dressed him up as a king of, for honor and glory. They put a crown of thorns on his head. And they abused him, spat on him, degraded him. When they had finished, they dressed him again in his own clothes and took him out for crucifixion. But you know, Jesus had already been beaten, flogged, hit with staffs, punched. His body was sore. He was hardly fit to move. And so the idea of carrying his own crossbeam to the place of crucifixion was difficult. And he fell. He couldn't carry it. So they found that they had to get someone to do it for him. So they, they found a man, Simon. We told Simon is the father of Alexander and Rufus. And Alexander and Rufus are both members of the early church. So Simon's a Serena, Serene, Cyrene. simply because of what had happened here. He carried the cross. They took Jesus outside of the temple, of course, to crucify him. Outside of Jerusalem, outside of the city gates, to a place they called the place of the skull. They offered him wine mixed with myrrh. This was custom enough because crucifixion was a very, very sore process, but myrrh numbed the pain took away the immediate pain because this was not done out of kindness but because the sudden shock of, of crucifixion could kill a man simply kill him dead the sudden shock of the body being poor by pain so it had become a custom among the Romans to give a little wine mixed with myrrh to deaden the nerve endings so that when a person was crucified they still had great pain but the shock that initial shock was dampened and therefore you ensured that they didn't die immediately from the pain but Jesus refused to drink it he knew what it was he didn't want it he knew that he could not have anything to remove the pain that he had to suffer nothing could deaden it as the Lamb of God he had to take the full measure of it. It was the ninth, it was the third hour. I keep saying that wrong, sorry for that. It was the third hour. And that meant it was nine o'clock in the morning, our time. Jesus was going to be on the cross for six hours. It would be three o'clock in the afternoon before he would be finally declared dead. But from 9 to 12, as he
he hung the cross between two thieves. The people mocked him, taunted him, called out to him, made his life, his last moments, torment. Because they were saying, we don't, we want to see these miracles you did. We want to see you bring yourself off the cross. We want to see you do the things you said you were going to do. Because when a man is on the cross, he's finished. That's it. Show us how you're going to get your way out of this one. So we can understand the concept, the mindset that was going against here. But there was another concept that was happening as well. Someone else. At 12 o'clock, on the sixth hour, the entire area was blackened out. This would have terrified the Romans. Never mind the Jews. This would have terrified the Romans. Because they knew that when there was omens like this here, something was happening with their gods. Something was happening of a religious manner. And they watched and they saw this because it wasn't it wasn't an eclipse because it was the wrong period of the year. The full moon existed. You couldn't have an eclipse in the moon in the full moon because the moon had to be opposite the sun. It couldn't get in front of the sun. So there was a difference here. They knew that. They understood the astronomy. So therefore when the, dull, when the sun becomes darkened, they had no explanation for it. They could not say what it was. But also, that darkness remained in place for three hours from the sixth to the ninth hour prolonged darkness as Jesus came to death. Jesus cries out. They give him wine mixed with vinegar, but again, he didn't drink it. He had said he wouldn't drink any of the fruit of the vine until he drinks it anew in the kingdom of his servants. And that hasn't happened yet, so Jesus still hasn't taken any wine until the day yet to come. The centurion who heard Jesus cry out his last was so struck by what was happening, by what he witnessed, that he was convinced that this also was the Son of God. When they took Jesus down from the cross, we have to understand that the process of taking him down on the cross and allowing him to be buried was unusual for the Jews uh, unusual for the Romans because they wouldn't have done it but in this case it would have been permitted for two reasons one it was coming up to being a very holy day the first holy day of the year the Passover the celebration of the first day of the name bread and the Jews would not have permitted anyone to have been on the, cr on the crosses at that time. And that's why they had actually asked in other Gospels for the two thieves to be put to death quickly. And their legs were broken to allow them to die before before the time that they would normally have been allowed to die, which would have been over days. And the reason for that was because they needed to have them off the crosses before before the Holy Day. Or it would have been, it would have been ritually unclean that day it would have it would have ruined it and therefore that would that could have led to a major rebellion and so they couldn't afford that so the Romans agreed to do this but Jesus had already died and when that was confirmed and remember a Roman guard knows when a man's dead he has to know but he knows when a man's dead and so when he said yes he's dead we can take 100% guarantee Jesus had completely totally and fully died. So he was given to Joseph of Amalekia. Now, here's an interesting thing. This gentleman was also a member of the council, but he hadn't agreed. He hadn't agreed with the decision for Jesus to be killed. He now took the body. Now, we know there was another with him, but he's not mentioned in Mark, and that is because this individual still was in the council at this time, and so Mark doesn't want to identify him. Later, John does. But at this moment, he's not identified. And they take the body and they use the ritual, the Jewish ritual of wrapping the body in strips of linen. This means that when we look at and hear things about the Tarant Shroud and different things like that, we have to understand 
That's total fiction because the body was never wrapped in a long piece of cloth. The, the, no, it wasn't wrapped up like that. It was done in strips, round, and the spices and the her and and the herbs and all of the different things to embalm the body was done on the outside through the bandages. Nothing was put in the inside of the body, only on the outside. And there was a, a substantial amount of stuff used to do this because Jesus was buried as a rich king. That's what actually done. He was buried really rich at his death. And so we know that the ladies who had witnessed this stood aside. They saw where he was buried. They saw what was happening. And they also saw that the preparation day was coming to an end. And that the Sabbath, the high day, the first day of unleavened bread was about to come upon them. They couldn't go and get the spices and things that they thought they would need to do the body. They didn't know that that had already been done for Jesus. They had simply saw where he had been taken. And they had saw where he had been taken by what they always presumed to be members of the council of the Sanhedrin. So they thought, we had better get up here and sort this out as quick as possible. But they couldn't. The Sabbath was upon them. So it would be only after the Sabbath that they could start making preparations for getting the necessary spices and ointments bought and prepared but then another Sabbath would soon overtake them. Those things have yet to be discussed and are within other concepts of the scripture. So we find that they know where he's laid and that's where chapter 15 stops. Chapter 16 closes the Gospel of Mark and we'll return to that now in a few minutes. This is William Exploding Word Ministries until the next time, see you again.